For everyone who's here, thank you so much for joining us for Language Learning in Children with Autism, a story of many paths to language development. My name is Megan Romanzik, and I'm a pediatric speech language pathologist. I'm also the community outreach and education lead at the Boston Ability Center. For those of you who don't know, the Boston Ability Center, also known as BAC, is an outpatient pediatric clinic located in Natick and Wellesley, Massachusetts. And we also serve all of Massachusetts through telehealth. We offer speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and feeding therapy. And we also have community groups of interest to maybe some people in the audience is I personally run a group um, specifically for neurodivergent tweens and teens um, to meet like-minded people and engage in games. It's called Community Game Day. You can find it on our website, same place you signed up. Um, and I'm really, really excited to introduce Dr. Jing Han Chi and Catherine Trice. Um, so a little bit about them. Dr. Chi is an assistant professor at Northeastern University, jointly appointed by the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders and the Department of Psychology. Let me just start my video up again. It's been a little wonky today. There we go. Um, and Dr. Chi directs the Language Acquisition and Brain Laboratory, also known as QLab. Her research goal is to understand the neurobiological organization of language in the human brain and how that organization changes from a childhood to adulthood. And then Catherine is a PhD student in psychology at Northeastern University. She holds a BA in linguistics and a minor in ASL from the University of Rochester. Um, at the end of this presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to write them in the chat. And without further ado, you guys take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Megan. It's our great pleasure to be here. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Let's see if that's up to one. And here, here we go. Okay, so let me see whether I can bring our Zoom view over here so I can see everyone. Okay, cool. All right. Hello, everyone. A little bit more about ourselves. Uh, so uh, my name is Zheng Han Qi. Um, I grew up in Shanghai, China, and I studied medicine before coming to the U.S. for my Ph.D. in neuroscience at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. I have been in the Boston area since 2012, and now I am a mother of a four-year-old girl. Yes, and hi, my name is Catherine Trice. I'm a PhD student in the psychology department at Northeastern. I grew up in upstate New York and studied linguistics in ASL and undergrad. I'm also an autistic individual myself, so I bring that perspective to the research we do. So these are some members of the Language Acquisition and Brain Laboratory at Northeastern University. So just disclaimer a little bit, uh, our research is funded by National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation, and Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. And uh, uh, many autistic people prefer identi identity first language, like autistic person to person first language, like person with autism, while some members within the community prefer person first language. So these preferences guide our semantic language choices. So in this talk, we use identity, identity first and person first language interchangeably throughout the talk to honor, honor these preferences. So today we are sharing with you what we learned from our lab's research, working with the autistic community about child language learning. And this is what children learn about their first language during the first few years of their life in a nutshell. So we are all very familiar with the developmental milestones that is associated with age. So we know by eight months old, children are probably able to tell the difference between their mother tongue and the foreign language, depending on the stress pattern, consonant, uh, consonant uh, pattern and sound combinations. And by 18 months old, toddlers are showing off their first 50 words and their knowledge of grammatical rules. And between toddler uh, stage and uh, kindergarten years, uh, they're also getting more and more familiar with the orthographic patterns from reading inputs. Um, however, um, even though uh, these are milestones that we are familiar with, but there's actually striking individual differences um, in language development. So this is... Uh, Called, uh, this is a project called Word Bank uh, that documented the analysis of thousands of parental report of children's vocabulary using MacArthur, MacArthur Bates communicative development inventory. So as you can see, children differ at how many words 
they produce at a given age. And each child also has a unique developmental trajectory across the age. So even for adults, many of us, including myself, learning a non-native language is a lifelong journey, and the level of language mastery varies uh, substantially across individuals. So this plot is adapted from a large-scale study in two-thirds million of na uh, native and non-native non English speakers, and uh, uh, the measurement of their proficiency uh, is a grammatical skill assessment. But as you can see, uh, the huge variabilities uh, exist across individuals, uh, re regardless how many years they have studied for the second language. So my lab's research in the past few years uh, has been focused on understanding individual differences in language learning uh, process and language learning outcomes. So how about language in autism? Uh, in autism, uh, even though language is no longer one of the diagnostic pillars in DSM-5 criteria, um, we, we know one third of children with autism uh, remain nonverbal or minimally verbal with no consistently recommended treatment. Um, and uh, even in the 50, uh, even in the verbal children with autism, there are over 50% of these children show delayed language uh, and reading skills. So research has also found that uh, adolescents who had more severe language impairment during childhood face more challenges in social communication domain. So um, speech language uh, therapy is still the most commonly identified intervention provided for children with autism. Um, even though no consistently recommended treatment is available for, uh, for all autistic children, majority of individuals still show uh, gains in communication after intervention. So we know language is important for autism uh, and it, language intervention is critically needed for autistic children. But uh, can we uh, use our understanding of typical language development uh, to help us um, design intervention methods for uh, children with autism? So um, today I will tell you uh, our uh, lab's research uh, that encompass two representative learning scenarios for kids. One is solo learning that is automatic and implicit, and the other one is learning that involves our social brains, either during communication uh, or making inferences that use our social brains. So the first one uh, is uh, learning, uh, implicit learning, and uh, one uh, paradigm that has been substantially studied uh, in typically developing children and in classic psych uh, developmental psychology literature is called statistical learning. So uh, the statistical learning um, is a jargon in our field, but uh, it's actually quite intuitive. So we, we learn how sounds are combined in our first language and how words are combined in a grammatical sentence effortlessly just through uh, our language inputs and through our experiences. So this is a sound wave um, image for a sentence, there is no pause in our, in our speech. You cannot rely on these uh, peaks and troughs of the sound waves to identify word boundaries, but pre-verbal infants actually are masters of uh, word, uh, word boundary identification. What they do is they rely on computing the co-occurrence frequencies of these sounds to find out, for example, no is a word while up is not a word. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, for natural language, uh, we know it's a vast, uh, it's a vast uh, uh, construct for children to master. So in order for us to characterize children's ability to learn statistical patterns from language, uh, we, we need to create some miniature artificial language in the lab to, uh, to study statistical learning. I forgot to tell you a fun example from my life uh, about uh, statistical learning. Um, so uh, for people who are uh, who, who are forced to watch Encanto, Encanto and forced to uh, listen to it. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno's for thousands of times uh, because they have a, a children uh, have a child at home. Uh, uh, let me tell you uh, what we discovered uh, in our household. So uh, after listening to we don't talk about Bruno for um, hundreds of times, 
um, my three-year-old then uh, daughter, uh, Ling Yao, uh, asked me a question, but what is brew? So this is statistical learning that's happening in front of you, right? So she is using her knowledge of no, that's the most powerful weapon in her life, uh, to segment new word brew from Bruno. And she she wants to learn Bruno, uh, the word brew, what that means. Um, and uh, that uh, sadly uh, uh, leads to uh, leads to a non-word in this case, but you can imagine that she is uh, leveraging on her existing vocabulary to learn new words all the time uh, to segment new words from this continual speech. This is statistical learning happening in front of you. Um, so in the lab, what we do, there, there are typically two phases. During the familiarization phase, uh, young infants and adults listen to this continual speech stream for a few minutes. I'll just play a few seconds for you. So after a few minutes, um, your, your brain will automatically figure out some adjacent songs always go together like 2P row, uh, but other adjacent songs like row and go only go together 25% of the time. So these co-occurrence cues lead to your preference to words like 2P row compared to non-words like tulaku. Um, so in the lab, we use different measures to uh, tell people's, uh, people's preference for these words. And based on decades of laboratory research with, uh, with infants, children, and adults, uh, we know that people are capable of learning such statistical information. However, um, uh, it's also uh, true that not everyone can do this task to the same degree of mastery. And uh, people also differ in in their uh, capability to learn from different types of inputs. So we design a very similar task, task like this, but only asking people to do one more thing. We ask them to keep track of a particular syllable and press the button whenever they hear this syllable shows up in the stream, uh, in the, uh, in the speech. So unknown to them, the target syllable appears to be the last element of a triplet. So, um, as you become more and more uh, familiar with the triplet pattern, your response time becomes faster and faster, and detecting the uh, target becomes easier and more predictable. Um, so here is one min a one minute video a about this task. task. Introduce the participant to an alien and its favorite word in its alien language. Dull. Inform the participant that they will listen to the alien's language and to remember to press the space bar whenever they hear the favorite word. Have the participant complete a practice trial before the familiarization phase in which they must press the space bar as soon as the alien's favorite word is heard. During the test phase, instruct the participant to select one of the two sequences that sound more familiar. The target sequence will be presented in the familiarization phase. Ha, mi, ku. The foil sequence will not have been previously presented. Go, lu, ku. So this task only takes five minutes. Um, and uh, we, uh, we also realize that only use one task does not completely capture our brain's learning profile uh, because uh, statistical learning process can be constrained by our sensory processing capacity. Uh, an individual who's good at learning visual patterns might not be so good at learning auditory patterns. So we created a battery of tasks under the theme of a space adventure for letters uh, speech syllables, images, and tones. Uh, so these tasks um, uh, can uh, can be uh, can be uh, administered to children five years and above. And we tested fifty five autistic children uh, and fifty uh, typically developing children matched on age um, and gender. And uh, what we found uh, is that it seems uh, there's a dissociation between. Uh, learning linguistic materials versus non-linguistic materials. So this plot uh, shows that 
typically developing children, autistic children, they have comparable performance for learning image sequences and tone sequences. However, autistic children are specifically struggling in learning letter sequences and syllable sequences. Um, so uh, we also ask parents to give us uh, uh, the, the rating of their children's language level. And uh, about half of these children came with parental report that their language level were below their age, uh, and the other half were at or above age. And if you look at non-linguistic uh, statistical learning performance, typically developing children and children, uh, autistic children with different language levels, they perform almost identical. However, um, if you look at their linguistic uh, statistical learning uh, performance, the uh, children whose language levels were below age showed particular weakness in learning letters and syllables, and children whose language level was typical uh, like, uh, still performed less well compared to uh, their neurotypical peers. Um, we also used a standardized sentence recall uh, assessment to uh, look at the association between language uh, statistical learning uh, skills and uh, their language skills measured by this assessment and found a very strong correlation. Um, and this relationship does not exist uh, between uh, the non-linguistic statistical learning performance and language skills. So um, you may ask uh, at this point, Okay, so in autistic population, linguistic statistical learning seems to be uh, weaker. Can we can we actually do anything to help them? Uh, is linguistic uh, statistical learning a skill that's malleable? Right. Every every parent might be uh, wondering that. So uh, we 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 think the answer is yes. Uh, because uh, we have some very interesting lab results are showing the potential of improving that. So within our lab, uh, experimental design, we actually have the ability to test that uh, hypothesis or possibility. So so remember they were uh, we were asking uh, participants to press the button when they whenever they hear the target target syllable. So just for example, the target syllable is boo. And whenever they hear boo, they need to press a button uh, during listening. So we call this Gola Boo as the attended triplet because it has the target. And all the other three triplets are uh, triplets that are not, uh, not associated with attention. So what we found is across um, uh, autistic uh, group and typically developing group, uh, children are more accurately uh, recognizing the attended triplet uh, compared to the unattended triplet. So their performance can be simply boosted by uh, attracting their attention to some element within this uh, input. So uh, we, we are very happy to see that. And uh, this, this uh, attention boosting effect uh, was also not related to children's concurrent language level. So no matter whether this child's um, language level is uh, at age or below age, it's um, the, the boosting effect is similarly uh, robust. So we have hope there. And another thing uh, we have been wondering is whether why learning syllable or ladder sequences uh, can be particularly challenging in autism. So uh, we looked at uh, the uh, existing language network in the brain and how that is engaged. Uh, uh, and we also looked at language related brain regions, how they are connected with each other. Um, one uh, particular language function that is related to the task you saw earlier is called phonological working memory. And it is also a, a goal of um, um, a, a common goal that uh, a lot of uh, speech therapy uh, in language is trying to uh, reach uh, during those uh, therapy sessions. So um, well, phonological working memory um, it, um, is a, a function that uh, involves temporary storage and the mani manipulation of speech sounds in mind. So it is measured by auditory tests of phonological awareness and verbal short-term memory that requires children to briefly uh, maintain those speech sound information in their mind. 
So one very well-known and sensitive task is non-word repetition. So uh, you, you can listen to this word. Stop a gratic. So, and your job is to repeat this word as accurately as possible. And uh, how accurate children can do this task reflects their concurrent language skill. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have been uh, uh, in our past research uh, working on uh, the neural correlates of phonological working memory in autism. Uh, the tools we have been using uh, is called uh, functional uh, uh, and structural magnetic uh, resonance imaging. And uh, uh, I'm going to show you a, a fun uh, a picture. Uh, so this is um, a MRI uh, imaging suite decorated in rainbow and stars by a seven-year-old young uh, designer after he has participated in our study. And here is another confident eight-year-old uh, participant posing for a real picture after we have captured the rainbows in her brain. Um, and uh, throughout these uh, uh, really, uh, uh, really uh, time-consuming but fun uh, experiences with our uh, child participants, we have already discovered uh, some interesting anatomical and functional uh, uh, correlates of phonological working memory. So uh, here uh, I'm showing you uh, a very uh, famous uh, brain region called Broca's area uh, that is uh, responsible for uh, speech production uh, and uh, grammatical uh, parsing uh, in language processing. And uh, there's another area called Wernicke's area located at the back of the brain as related, that is uh, related to language comprehension. Um, and uh, sound, uh, speech sound uh, mapping. So uh, a technique diffusion tensor imaging uh, is a way to look at how different brain areas are connected by a white matter. And uh, these colored areas are all classic language brain regions. This, uh, uh, this uh, white matter tracts called left arcuate fascicular connects Broca's area in the front of the brain and Wernicke's area at the back of the brain, and it constitutes an important component of our language system, supporting both phonological processing and word to sound mapping. So in typically developing uh, children and uh, in many uh, existing adult literature, we know that arcuate fasciculus is very important for language function. Uh, so using this technique, uh, we measured the, the brain connectivity uh, in, uh, in a few white, uh, white matter tracts. And we found, yes, uh, it does look like this tract shows lower connectivity in the autistic group compared to typically developing group. But we also found another area in the right hemisphere is showing similar uh, differences between groups. Um, Although in the typical population, the left hemisphere, this arcuate fasciculus is known for its important role in phonological processing, but uh, in autistic children, this tract is not associated with their phonological working memory. Uh, instead, um, it's the right hemisphere. It's the right hemisphere, the higher or the better connectivity in the right hemisphere uh, uh, the better um, phonological working memory performance is in uh, autistic children, okay? So the other method we used is, uh, uh, is functional MRI. We looked at how children's brain functions during this uh, non-word repetition task. And uh, uh, we, again, replicated many behavioral uh, findings in the literature that autistic children uh, perform less accurately in repeating those, uh, those um, noun words from two syllable three, to three syllable, four syllable and five syllable. Uh, they, they, they seem to, their performance seem to be uh, in average uh, relatively uh, reduced compared to neurotypical controls in behavior. And uh, the difference in the behavior, interestingly, is not uh, explained by their brain differences in areas for speech perception or in areas for maintaining the speech sounds called working memory areas, but only in the areas that are responsible for speech production. 
so so this area called supplemental motor area, uh, it, it is uh, it is important for planning speech motor sequences, and it is uh, uh, less activated during uh, non-word repetition for autistic children compared to neurotypical uh, controls. And uh, interestingly, for another control group we included, that these are children who perform similarly in non-word repetition as autistic children, also uh, reduced performance than neurotypical controls. Uh, they, are the, uh, they are children who struggle with reading. However, their um, motor area activates similar to the same, same level as neurotypical. Uh, controls. So that means the reduced engagement of speech motor area seems to be specific to autistic children uh, when they are trying to learn these uh, uh, these sound sequences. So to very quickly summarize, uh, what we found is that uh, there are some differences between autistic children and typically developing children in linguistic statistical learning, especially they show weakness in learning syllable sequences and letter sequences. And they seem to be uh, less uh, accurate, uh, uh, less uh, accurate in repeating noun words, uh, a measure for phonological working memory. Um, however, uh, uh, their reduced uh, white matter connectivity in the right hemisphere uh, underlies the phonological working memory function, not the left hemisphere. And they also showed uh, reduced speech motor functions in the brain. Um, but we also found uh, encouragingly very, very interesting uh, similarities between this, uh, these two uh, groups. Uh, so first of all, they have intact uh, implicit learning capability to learn image se sequences, tone sequences, and uh, um, their speech perception network in the brain uh, seem to uh, uh, support phonological working memory just as well. And working memory network is also intact, uh, is uh, similarly activated during non-word repetition. So, uh, so there are some very interesting specific uh, differences there uh, cont uh, contributing to what we have observed in behavior. So what we have seen uh, is, is children's learning of an artificial language or made up words, but in the real world, how well uh, children can accurately repeat a real sentence is also an indicator of language skill. So uh, our interest in this experiment is on how children spontaneously adapt to speakers' intonation in their own speech production. So we tested um, two uh, groups of children and asked them to repeat a sentence like- The big football, the big player, football player washed the player car washed with the hose. Oh, here, here we go. The big football player washed the car with the hose. Okay, and we also uh, artificially uh, raised the pitch of the same sentence. The big football player washed the car with the hose. And we asked uh, children to repeat exactly what they hear. And uh, 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 unsurprisingly, the accuracy of repetition in autistic children is relatively reduced compared to typically developing children due to their, um, their comorbid language impairment. Um, but uh, very, uh, we, we actually found some very interesting uh, speech accommodation differences between these two groups. Um, but before I show you the results, I want to uh, tell you that we also run a, uh, another experiment asking typically developing children to explicitly copy the voice and repeat the sentence. And then we ask them to rate whether the speaker's voices are different uh, or not, or how do they sound. So when speaker's voice sounds uh, normal, or we call they have lower pitch, children show very similar level of accommodation. So this is the uh, measure of distance there of their speech production, the pitch of their speech production compared to the model talker. So uh, as you can see, the typically developing group, the autistic group and the follow-up group, they all show similar uh, distance. However, when the pitch of the voice is elevated, which was, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, rated as a little bit odd, according to typically developing children, they uh, 
their production, uh, of their pitch production when repeating the sentence um, becoming became more different from the model talker for the typically developing group. However, autistic group, uh, they, they kept accommodating to the speech. Their speech uh, became more similar uh, to typically uh, to, to the model talker. And for, um, for typically developing children, only when they were explicitly asked to mimic what the model talker was saying, could they actually lower the uh, lower the distance or raise their pitch? So that means um, that uh, the spontaneous ac accommodation shown by children with autism may represent some hidden learning toolkit in this population. So where, whereas typically developing children, they could adjust their learning outcomes according to the speaker's identity and the characteristics, while autistic children, they cast very little judgment and they do not close any doors for learning. Um, so future studies, uh, we, uh, future studies uh, in naturalistic settings will need to uh, be done to investigate whether autistic children uh, form the same social attributes based on the voice of model talkers and whether that influences their pitch accommodation. Um, so um, now we are going to switch gears to learning that engages social, engage, uh, social brain. Um, so we know that in typically developing a language, uh, 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 typically developing children, um, eye gaze and pointing gestures support early word learning and uh, uh, the ability to follow gazes predict receptive and expressive vocabulary in uh, typical development. Um, but um, we also know that um, as, um, as children grow older, it, it feels like we learn a lot of content from, uh, from decontextualized con uh, context like you, you might be sitting in cafe and uh, uh, you, you overhear people uh, talking about your favorite TV show, or you, you're listening to lectures like, like now, or you're listening to me talking, I'm, ta I'm addressing to the whole group, but not directly to you. So the social context of learning uh, does change uh, as we, uh, we grow up. So what we are interested in is that whether uh, social context of learning has an impact uh, on uh, word learning outcomes and uh, whether autistic children have a different learning preference or a strategy compared to uh, typically developing children. So what we did was we designed two conditions. Um, the, uh, in one condition, the speaker who's holding the book uh, is directly addressing the uh, child uh, sitting in front of the screen. Say, I'm going to tell you a story about Alex the bear. Um, so I have a, uh, an example here. Shirley's Halloween. Tomorrow is Halloween. Shirley will dress up as a witch to make sure she looks very pretty. Shirley also asks her mom to help her braid her bosa. On the day of Halloween, Shirley puts on her costume. Everything looks perfect except for just one thing. Sure. Oh, sorry. Uh, it somehow restarted. But uh, I hope you noticed there was a new word bosa in the in the story. And if you paid attention to what the speaker was saying, Bosa means hair, right? And uh, um, well, there's also a uh, another listener listening to the speaker at the same time. And it does look a little bit awkward, but children never complain. Um, for uh, uh, for the other condition, we call it overhearing condition. And uh, uh, basically, the child is overhearing the story. The uh, speaker is talking, uh, telling the story to the listener on the screen. Um, so what we uh, expect is that for young children uh, who really need this social cues to guide their learning, they will remember the words that were learned from directly addressed context 
better compared to overhearing context. So we tested their uh, learning the, uh, by using, um, using this uh, alternative force choice task. Uh, we asked them to pick the picture. Uh, so in that uh, story, it was Bosa. So you will actually see hair here with uh, other, um, uh, other destructors on the screen. And you, uh, you're going to choose one out of the four pictures to match the, uh, match the word you hear. And we test this uh, 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 immediately after learning, 10 minutes after learning, and one week after learning. So as we kind of expected, typically developing children, they remember the words uh, better uh, when we test their memory one week later uh, compared to the overhearing context. Uh, so in the directly addressed context, the words were remembered better compared to the words learned in the overhearing context. However, this trend was reversed for the autistic children. And uh, uh, the overall, uh, if you count the, their accuracy, the, 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 the bars, uh, putting them together, they, they remember the same amount of words. It's just the words that they remember better were actually overheard words, right? Not the directly addressed words. And uh, uh, we also looked at the predictors of word memory. So uh, looking at individual differences of vocabulary and theory of mind, uh, we found that typically developing children, they will uh, use their existing vo vocabulary to scaffold their further learning. So greater concurrent vo uh, vocabulary predicts better new word memory. Um, so we use this uh, picture vocabulary test uh, to measure their vocabulary. However, for autistic children, the, their concurrent vocabulary uh, uh, actually at a similar level uh, as these typically developing kids were very sim uh, were not associated with their uh, new word learning um, outcomes. It was their theory of mind skills um, that. Um, uh, that uh, is strongly associated with uh, their word learning outcomes. And they also, uh, we found that the more they look at the speaker during overheard speech, the better they remember those words as well. So when the speaker was not staring at them, the more the, uh, they look at the speaker on the screen uh, was also a, so, uh, uh, an indicator of their later learning. So quick summarize, uh, we found that autistic children had lower sentence repetition accuracy, um, but uh, also lower short-term uh, ret retention uh, for word meanings. Um, they seem to uh, have uh, less learning uh, or reduced learning from directly addressed speech. However, during sentence repetition, even though they had lower accuracy, they showed greater speech accommodation. They, uh, they, this is another implicit learning toolkit uh, that is uh, not related to speech content, but related to speech acoustics. And they also show greater long-term memory. The, their long-term memory is um, more stable compared to um, typically developing children. Typ typically developing children, they for forget a lot but uh, autistic children, they maintain their memory of those words. And they also learn from, uh, they, they prefer learning from overheard speech, sorry about the typo, compared to the directly addressed speech. Okay, I will uh, switch gears and uh, let uh, Catherine to present one of her studies uh, that is relevant to social cognition and word learning as well. Yes. So while I've helped a lot with all our other studies in the lab, the main one I've been focusing on right now looks at social cognition and word learning in autistic children. So when children and adults learn words, what we are fundamentally asking them to do is a task of discovering meanings, mapping what is said onto what is meant. Sometimes this can be straightforward and novel words can have a clear one-to-one -one mapping. But oftentimes our natural world is cluttered and busy, making the speaker's meaning ambiguous. How then might language learners address this? One such way is through our inferences. For example, take the following scenario in which someone says, look, the dog is eating a stad. In the image on the left, it's easy to assign the novel word stad to the novel object the sole dog is eating. 
But in the image on the right, where you see two dogs eating two different unknown objects, how would you determine which is the stat? In one case, you might assume that the reason the speaker is remarking on this at all is that it's surprising or worrying, and thus stad would refer to the non-edible object. However, if the dog's owner was previously complaining about how the dog would not eat his new treats, then made this remark, this might lead you to believe that stad refers to the edible treat. In none of these cases is stad clearly defined. Instead, we are relying our assumptions of the speaker's goal in the first ambiguous case or conversational context in the second to make an inference about the speaker's intended referent. We often do this via reasoning about what a speaker thinks, intends, or knows, a skill referred to as theory of mind. However, difficulties in areas traditionally covered under theory of mind are a central aspect of autism, with even basic diagnostic features intertwined with it. Previously, research on how theory of mind difficulties interact with word learning have focused on basic social cues, such as eye gaze or pointing, with little to no attention paid to more complex inferences in ambiguous scenarios. This is in spite of the fact that even seemingly basic assumptions that may support speaker-based inferences may not be reliably utilized by some autistic individuals until well into their teenage years. Thus, we set out to discover if autistic children can reliably assign words to objects via these speaker-based inferences, and whether these words are remembered better or worse than those whose mappings are immediately clear. We also ask what underlying traits of a given autistic individual may guide whether they show or fail to show such an advantage. This will allow us to better understand why some children may succeed while others fail, and evaluate autistic children for likely success or difficulty in this area of word learning. So in this experiment, participants learned words in two different conditions. In both, they're asked to select a toy that Mary, the speaker, likes. In the inference condition, the speaker would say something like, look, I like this dinosaur, it's holding a mel. However, since there are two different dinosaurs, each holding a, I got this to appear, I'm sorry, shared novel object, and one holding a unique object, I'm sorry, this is the new mouse for me, but rainbow things are shared. There's a pink C-shaped thing that is unique. What the male is, is ambiguous. To identify the correct dinosaur, the listener must infer that the speaker intends for the novel referent to disambiguate between the two dinosaurs and believes they have given you enough information to do so. Therefore, Mel must refer to the unique novel object that is the disambiguating feature between the two dinosaurs. And the correct answer would be the dinosaur on the right. In the other condition, the direct mapping condition, the word can only feasibly be mapped onto the given novel object in the display, with this thus being the correct answer. Note, before we begin our results in autistic children, we've seen in typically developing children our age range in adults, there is better memory for inferred words long-term over those directly mapped. We also tracked where the children looked during learning to see when they settled on the correct answer. So what did we find? Generally, autistic children are able to resolve inferences, meaning that they could reason about what other people likely intended in ambiguous scenarios, and in fact, remember these words better than those directly mapped. Here you can see that we tested their memory for these words both right after learning, so the orange bars, and 20 minutes later after an extremely stressful, extremely verbal task to wipe any short-term memory they have of the words, the pink bars. And note that this memory, like we saw previously, is very stable over time. And this is a strength they had relative to their typically developing peers, who, if you had looked at their version of the graph, they forgot a ton of words between immediate recall and retention. Mm -hmm. They have the same pattern, but their memory was terrible, and autistic <laughs> children were beautiful at this. Mm -hmm. However, this isn't true in all children. In fact, when we tease apart the advantage, we see two drastically different retention profiles for autistic children with one group, over here on the left side of the screen, um, showing an advantage for inferred words and another over here on the right side of the screen with a clear direct mapping, one-to-one -one mapping advantage. However, when we examined when the children started reliably looking at the correct referent rather than switching between the two, we did find that even the children with the inference advantage settled on this target more slowly than their age match typically developing peers indicating that even if they do this successfully and remember these words successfully, it still may be a challenge for them to resolve these inferences in the first place. 
And importantly, our two groups did not differ on any of our currently selected behavioral metrics we looked at, language ability, nonverbal intelligence, intervention services, age, among others, indicating that these do not adequately capture or explain the difference in word learning. Despite both explicit measures of accuracy during mapping and retention, and the implicit measures of eye tracking during learning showing robust and reliable group differences. Furthermore, none of our theory of mind tasks we collected differed in accuracy between groups. So in summary, a subset of autistic individuals show a memory advantage for words mapped via reasoning about another's intent, indicating that this may be a robust memory mechanism for supporting word learning. However, a different subset of autistic individuals Remember words better if there's a clear and straightforward one-to-one -to -one mapping. Finally, there are no significant group differences in individual difference measures between our subgroups, indicating other skills, including their abstract ability to reason about others' intent, do not determine which memory mechanism is best. A final point I'd like to discuss is one possible reason for better memory of inferred words for some children that you can leverage yourself. Here, autistic children may be evoking active encoding. We know that words learned in active encoding scenarios, ones where children can manipulate order and pacing, have an advantage in long-term memory retention, which emerges between the ages of five and eight compared to passively learned words. Since resolving ambiguous situations involves much more active engagement over one's mental processes, resolving references may have a similar effect. So what can you, as parents of autistic children, do with this knowledge to support your child's word learning? An approach that may be beneficial is testing out using different levels of complexity to teach novel word learning. We've observed some children learn and retain words better through one-to-one -one instruction. However, other children may benefit from higher level mental processes, such as inferencing, in order to learn and retain word meaning. As such, each child may have their own preference. Allowing children to actively engage with material and giving them more control on their learning interpretations and hopefully aid in stronger memory of learned concepts. However, from our study, we still see no clear path to choose based on other skills or life experiences your child may have. Thus, you should feel free to be an experimenter yourself. See if your child later remembers a word better if they had to guess its meaning over if you just told them outright or vice versa. And keep track of what sort of circumstances they guess correctly or may struggle in. In conclusion, Word learning in ambiguous scenarios can follow many paths. What determines the path a given autistic child may take is not adequately captured in our current metrics, as we saw distinctive word learning strategies in autistic children otherwise matched in every way. This, as well as everything else in this presentation, opens up many directions for future research that I hope you all will be involved in. The most primary of which is, a is the question of what underpins different language learning mechanisms in autistic children and how this relates to their long-term language outcomes. That's my part. Okay, great. And uh, we have a few final slides to share. So uh, as researchers, we are really seeking partnership uh, with uh, the community, including parents and clinicians. Uh, we especially would appreciate feedback uh, from autistic community about our research design, research directions, and how we interpret our findings. And uh, uh, we also would appreciate research participation uh, because um, you will get information, more information about you and your child through this experience and also uh, get to try some cutting edge research and science methods. So just a plug for our ongoing research. Um, we are inviting first graders in the Boston area to participate in our awesome Plaza project in the spring. And this project will actually investigate the relationship between statistical learning that you heard about at the beginning of the talk uh, and the uh, long-term growth in language and literacy in autistic children. And uh, we are also put, uh, compiling a, um, a form uh, for parents uh, with some links and resources um, so this link, um, one of our uh, lab members also joined us. Uh, so she, uh, Blaine, uh, uh, probably has posted this uh, link on the chat uh, for uh, parents to access. 
And uh, uh, one thing I uh, want to uh, emphasize is the two resources I highly recommend it to any um, families with autistic uh, individuals. One is the Spectrum um, website with, uh, with the option to sign up for newsletters. Uh, and this uh, newsletter has the most updated research news in the field and very, uh, very well uh, written uh, news report. And uh, the other one is Simon's Powering uh, Autism Research. And we actually work with many families in this uh, Spark uh, uh, in this Spark organization. So uh, there's website there. Uh, you can click and sign up and being part of this big community of research and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, researchers and uh, uh, participating families um, for different opportunities. So lastly, uh, we uh, these are the a list of the collaborators uh, in research um, studies that I mentioned and uh, the key contributors of the uh, findings that you heard about today. And uh, here are our contact uh, methods. Okay, uh, that's all uh, about our presentation. If you have any questions, please uh, let us know. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I, as a speech language pathologist, definitely learned a lot. And I feel like a lot of the research you're doing is both supporting and giving ideas for how to clinically address some of the things you see with the kids that I see. Um, so if any of you have any questions, please do stick around. You can either unmute yourself or you can pop something into the chat. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for your attention. I also uh, know there are a few questions that were submitted uh, during the registration uh, stage, right? Uh, I do wonder whether um, there are burning questions from the audience. Uh, we can address them first, then uh, perhaps uh, we can leave some time for the, for the other questions that were submitted earlier. Hi, good evening. First of all, thank you both for your presentation this evening. Very informative and similar to you, Megan, I'm also coming at this from the angle of a SLP, a clinician myself. Um, and I work with an early intervention. So that's from children birth to three. So I don't work with any children older than three years old. The day before their third birthday, they kind of move on. Um, and so I was wondering if you guys had any ideas about how to promote that um, phonological working memory in these young children, um, especially with uh, some of the autistic kids that I see, or maybe they don't even yet have a diagnosis, they're so young, but likely are presumed autistic. Um, and we work a lot on that repetition, repeating words after myself or after their parents or their family. Mm. Um, and with your findings that it seems to be more facilitative through the right hemisphere of the brain? What yeah. sorts of things, So, how can, how can I tap into that? Right, right. That's a very good question. And phonological working memory is uh, such a critical function um, of building blocks for language development. Um, and uh, in our research, we haven't yet tapped onto malleability of uh, phonological working memory. Um, however, we did find out that uh, when we were asking children to repeat um, either sentences or uh, words in, in a non-social uh, context, they are doing uh, above and beyond what they are asked to do these autis autistic children. They they are taking in a lot of information that is not uh, directly related to the task, right? So they they even uh, uh, they even accommodate their speech production and raise their pitch or adjust their pitch uh, to to be more similar to the model talker. So so I I think that kind of effort. Um, distracted them from what they are supposed to uh, pay attention to the content of speech. Um, so so I, I wonder whether there are ways that uh, future intervention might be able to focus on to uh, give more explicit um, um, 
scaffold uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, and uh, bring their attention to to the content of speech and uh, uh, make sure they understand uh, what they we are asking them to do and uh, not not spending efforts on um, on the vari variabilities of speech that is not directly related to 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 the uh, to learning about language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I I saw a question from Ann Johnson on the chat uh, about just dot language learning and how this ties into our research. Yes. Uh, and uh, I honestly uh, just dot language learning uh, was a new concept to me. And I uh, I saw uh, one of uh, the questions. Uh, uh, in the registration form, and uh, I try to teach myself about that concept before this um, this talk. Um, so uh, I I think the, it's actually quite relevant. Uh, just that language learning um, in in the clinical context talks about uh, how uh, children are uh, uh, are using this uh, whole chunk uh, chunk chunking strategy to learn the whole phrase. Uh, uh, that that is uh, relatively rigid and cannot be uh, generalized to other contexts. And uh, I uh, so from my perspective, I see that uh, that kind of behavior reflecting both the strength, the memory strength uh, that we talked about. They have very stable memory, uh, very good rote memory, uh, but also uh, tap into their um, their weaknesses in. Uh, in uh, learning the relationship between the elements within that chunk. So, so without paying attention to the relationship uh, between the uh, elements within, for example, um, uh, the sentence, um, um, uh, Billy likes the train. Um, if the, this is the whole chunk they are learning, they are not, uh, they, they, they are not analyzing the uh, word order or the, uh, the um, grammatical uh, roles of this sentence, uh, each word in the sentence. It's like what we were talking about in the statistical learning experiment. In order to uh, uh, learn flexibly, you, you do need to analyze the, uh, the relationship between the elements within a chunk. So, so in order to um, help them to um, pay attention to the elements uh, within a chunk, uh, we we showed that um, asking them to press the button whenever they hear something actually helped them to learn that particular triplet. And uh, I I think there might be ways to combine our research into uh, future intervention that's uh, involved in this just start uh, language learning strategy. Uh, in autistic children. So I don't know whether this directly addresses your question and uh, hopefully uh, it, it is uh, relevant. Yeah. I can jump in as well. One thing that stood out to me because as a clinician, I'm a little bit more familiar with just adult language processing and um, work with many individuals who process language in this way. One thing that really stood out to me was um, a big discrepancy in performance between the autistic test group and the non-autistic test group in um, statistical learning for sentences, but then um, similar performance when it came to statistical learning for the tone sequences. Yeah. And I think that's something that's well documented for just alt language processors really being reliant on the intonation and the tone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is a really cool opportunity to see how this research grows because it really gives credence to what we see clinically, but hasn't yet been very well documented in the research. And this is kind of showing that very, um, uh, I guess, evidence for that difference in, in learning. So. Right, right. The, the delayed echolalia uh, also uh, um, gives you the sense of that they echo everything the uh, the including the content and including the uh intonation in speech right so so uh, autistic kids are very very sensitive to um to the intonation and the uh, pitch contour in speech and they they are a master of 
showing learning uh, in different ways for that uh, domain. Uh, if we can leverage their strength to help help them learn uh, language content, that, that would be the direction I think in the future. Yeah. And also as what is the best method to teach phonological skills for reading in students with autism? Should we do something different that we what we already do for children with dyslexia, or do those methods work for autistic students with poor phonological working memory as well? This is a fantastic question. We were talking about reading uh, in uh, students with autism, and there was a question uh, in the Q and A list about hyperlexia in autism, and also another fa uh, fascinating um, topic. So I. Um, I do study uh, reading uh, in a uh, non-autistic uh, population. And what we have found is that auditory statistical learning predicts uh, reading skills and reading difficulties um, in non-autistic population, um, not visual statistical learning, interestingly. Um, but uh, for the uh, for what we saw in the autistic children sample in the study, uh, there's one very interesting phenomenon I didn't mention is that typically developing children, their ability to learn syllable sequences are highly related to their ability to learn letter sequences. However, the, these two abilities are decoupled in uh, autistic group, um, and uh, we. I, I, I don't have empirical data, but I feel like that is relevant to hyperlexia um, anecdote I have heard about in the autistic uh, population. Um, the, the, the order we would expect uh, to happen a, a between speech, uh, between spoken language uh, learning versus uh, written language learning uh, is not always uh, sequential uh, like that in uh, autistic population um, and uh, the way how they learn um, learn uh, to read uh, may be a, an alternative route that will be worth uh, tapping into uh, in the future and um, uh, in terms of how to uh, teach phonological skills um, I yeah I think that these are the whether teaching phonological skills directly help them uh, learn uh, learn reading may, may be a question mark, right? Because these two skills might be more decoupled in this population uh, than in a uh, typically developing group. So that's my two cents, but uh, uh, apparently there needs to be a lot of uh, research going on. Thank you. Great questions. Do we want to address the other sent in questions now that if no one else is asking? So, yeah. Right. So three-year-old uh, boy uh, uh, with autism and nonverbal, and uh, um, he has a hard time uh, with speech therapist during speech periods every day. Uh, so, so uh, I, I guess we have SLPs on the call. Uh, I do wonder uh, how, how both of you address um, behavioral uh, challenges with young children on the spectrum. Uh, that is something I, I also need to learn. <laughs> sure, um, if you, you can either unmute yourself or if you wanna clarify in the chat, are you speaking to behavioral challenges or are you speaking to difficulties with with progress or with relationship building um because that might shape the way <laughs> we answer yeah. yeah and while you go ahead and clarify that if we want to answer any other questions um because I definitely want to get to that but I want to make sure I'm answering the question you're asking mm -hmm. yeah I know this is a a, a difficult uh, time uh, for for parents to type it's a bad time <laughs> so parents are very busy uh, with with bedtime routines at the moment <laughs> yeah yeah I can I can start answering if, if you have a time to type go for it if not um 
basically there's a whole bunch of reasons why speech therapy or any kind of therapy may not be successful. Um, and, and, and I think it may take some problem solving and brainstorming to figure out, is it, um, is it like, you know, is it that the way in which speech therapy is being delivered isn't working for this particular child for a number of reasons? So is it the style of therapy? Like, is is it a more drill-based therapy where the kid might benefit from more play-based therapy? Is it something about the sensory environment? Is the room too bright? Is it too loud? Um, is it the materials you're using um, in the therapy session. So whether or not it's something that is um, both like affirming to the child, but also kind of engaging to the child. Um, so those are a lot of different questions to ask. Um, if your question is more geared towards progress, um, I would say that the advice I would give is probably based on what are the specific goals that you have for your child and challenges that your child is having. Um, and then I could give you a more tailored response. Um, in the email that I sent to give this link, you can just email me back individually. I am a speech language pathologist. I am more than happy to help. Um, so we can set up a time to have a call and talk about your kids specifically. And that goes for anyone on the chat. Um, feel free to email if you have like specific clinical questions. Thank you, Megan. And similarly, Megan, to kind of expand off of what you said about where you, we don't really know what isn't working for your son at this moment. And I think a good way that um, I'll sum it up for parents that I, the parents of children that I work with in a sentence is following their lead. So making it affirming and engaging, I think are the words that you said, Megan. So it's something that your son likes, something that gets him excited. And if that is sitting at a table and doing flashcards, great. <laughs> if that is um, singing a song in a swing, okay, sure, we'll do that too. Um, but So I like to think a lot about following the child's lead and meeting the child where they are. Would you like to? Oh, yes. Um, so one of the other questions that we got sent ahead of time was um, a question on at what point in develop does language learning, does language acquisition begin to flatline and improvements in games become minimal? And what are some strategies that parents can use to help teens who are verbal but still have difficulty expressing themselves and expanding length and complexity of sentence ideas? So I'll address both of these in turn. And then after that, ask the SLPs to chime in with more specific advice. Uh, so in terms of when a language acquisition begins to flatline, Way back when yonder, um, the idea was that children, they have a very short period in which they can learn language, and then once they're like five or so, they really can't learn new things anymore. This is something we definitely don't believe anymore. You can learn language across your whole life. You can learn words and vocabulary across your whole life. Once you get into maybe like your teenage years and your 20s, you may have more difficulty picking up complex things like sentence structure or specific morphology like ed goes on the end of these past tense words, but not these ones and those little finicky things. But even then, it's not like you have to be a very young child to learn language well. And we especially actually see this with the deaf community because a lot of deaf individuals don't have access to language during early childhood or at least language that they can easily access and process and use until they get into a situation where they can learn sign language. So a lot of them don't start learning easily accessible language to them till they go to school or even several years into their school years when they start maybe having someone that's actually now teaching them sign language and they may not even get fully immersed for a long time. Yet a lot of them still become very fluent language users of sign language, even if they might not pick up all the grammatical stuff. And that's something to keep in mind for your children as well. They have their entire lives to continue to learn and develop their language skills. And then in terms of some strategies parents can use, if you have a verbal child that may have difficulty expressing themselves, or expanding ideas. Uh, one thing I'd like to call back to in our research is the fact that we found social situations can be more challenging in a lot of ways. Um, that they have very good memory, they have very good learning, but they learn better from overhearing versus when there's like this eye contact going on. Um, they learn 
can learn better in some cases if they have to infer what another person's thinking, but in other cases, they like these clear mappings. So coming up with fun strategies and games that don't involve social pressure, don't necessarily involve this back and forth and staring at them and having these other things they need to process in this high pressure there might give them time to focus on language and expanding these ideas that they might not have otherwise. However, I'm sure that the SLPs have much more clinically precise ways of giving this feedback. And I think you guys should take over for the rest of that question. Sure, yeah, that was a wonderful answer. And I agree, um, language development occurs across the lifespan and, and there's no, you know, they used to say there's this critical period. Now we know, and I've seen personally working with teenagers and adults and, and seeing language continue to grow. Um, in terms of strategies, I think it's almost similar to kind of what we said before, um, helping someone develop language, it, it really matters to give something that's meaningful and, and personalized to them. And so if we make the assumption that everyone thrives under kind of this very social learning context, we're not necessarily going to see the same gains. And so we think about what is meaningful to the individual and providing language therapy through that avenue. So um, I just came from clinic and I was working with a variety of individuals. The last person I saw, we were working on learning some higher level emotional vocabulary, like conflicted or anxious in the context of watching clips from high school musical and talking about it and writing stories about it. Um, and the person prior to that really, really loves drawing pictures. And so we draw out conversations between two characters um, and that's how they learn best. Um, and so it's often finding like, what is your child or your your teenager, even your adult, I'm really interested in and engaged with and using strategies that are specific to um, how they learn language best. Um, I could talk about this for hours, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Sounds good. Great. Um, I think relevant to the last question, we also got another one. Does television negatively impact language development? I think after this talk, you may have a different uh, idea to the answer of this question. Um, so um, we know for very young children and the previous research uh, in a typically developing group showed that uh, children do not learn as effectively from television uh, compared to a very socially engaging uh, context. However, um, autistic children might have very different preference. Um, and uh, it's very important to uh, work with them, find out uh, what is their uh, preferred learning profile and uh, uh, and uh, accommodate to, uh, to their communication needs and the learning needs. So uh, I, I think our research have really highlighted very different profiles across individuals, especially Catherine's uh, uh, talk uh, where we saw drastically different preference of learning um, context. Um, uh, actually, these two groups of uh, kids, they are almost identical in any other measurements that we can get from standardized uh, language and cognitive measures. So uh, so I think parents may know their kids best uh, in, in the uh, in the uh, how, um, natural naturalistic communication uh, scenario. So uh, if, if some kids might uh, might uh, really th thrive uh, learning from overheard speech <laughs> in television actually. I wanted to add a comment on it. It's not a personal clinical experience of mine, but I'm reading this amazing book. It's called Life Animated. Mm -hmm. And it's about, oh, you're familiar with it? Okay, yes. so it's about this, um, it's written by the father of this autistic boy. And this boy, he used, it's a couple years old now. This person is now living his life. He's a grown man. But when he was younger, he was he loved Disney movies and he still does. And this is how he, he used these movies and these characters and the dialogue to kind of build his world off of it. And it's, it's fascinating. And I would recommend it to anybody, clinician, parents, people not even directly impacted in any way by autism. It's really interesting. And it goes to show how people might say, don't let your child watch too much TV. It's not good for their social development. It's not good for their language development. Um, but that your guys's research does bring up and this kind of personal evidence does bring up interesting well not always kind of caveats <laughs> to it all 
Yes, exactly. Um, trying to find out uh, another um, another book that's actually new, uh, also uh, written by a professor at Northeastern University. Uh, it's called Kids Across the Spectrums, uh, Growing Up Autistic in the Digital Age. And this is a new book about how uh, children on the spectrum, um, you uh, they, they interact with media and the technology in their everyday lives. Um, and um, I am still reading this book. It's a really, uh, it, it's a really new book. I, I'm putting this link um, on, uh, on the chat box here and um, highly recommend it. Yeah. Okay, I also uh, saw another question about uh, multi, lingual uh, family, how uh, how uh, parents should uh, interact with uh, an autistic child uh, when the household uh, speaks multiple languages. And this is uh, this is definitely a, a frequently asked question um, in uh, in uh, families where uh, bilingual uh, development and um, language development in autism they co-occur right you you want to help uh children to communicate uh, at the same time um, the there are also uh heritage languages uh, language skills that uh, are undergoing this critical period uh that you don't want to miss so it, it is a, a this is a real dilemma that parents are facing um I myself am raising a bilingual child and uh, she was uh, actually uh, experiencing this uh, called selective mutism uh, when she, uh, for almost a half year uh, when she uh, switched uh, her daycare uh, uh, and uh, experiencing a lot of anxiety during that time. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, at that time, it, it it was a difficult choice for us to consider whether we should uh, we should promote just single language at home or not. Um, so in bilingualism li uh, literature, uh, for people who study bilingual, uh, and it is crucial for parents to promote this heritage language at home uh, because they, this is. In, at home before they hit school age, it is actually uh, the dominant language and this uh, this period is uh, sacred. After they uh, become uh, school age, the dominant language will have to be uh, the language be being used in school and the heritage language skills uh, will face a huge threat of the, uh, 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 you, you, children, children will uh, gradually uh, lose that language skills if the, they don't really have enough practice at home. So, so for researchers who study bilingual uh, development, they will definitely tell you, no, don't, uh, please don't uh, only promote English. But if, uh, if you, your priority is uh, to, to give, uh, your child um, a supportive environment uh, um, in inside of, in at home and outside of home uh, um, and to make sure they uh, they are uh, communicating well with uh, the whole support team then uh, either uh, then I, I think these are reasonable choices um, so depending on whether your support team have, uh, bilingual uh, therapists or not, and they are hard to find, I know. Yes. It, uh, I can obviously speak to this much less, mm -hmm. but it can also be worth it to keep in mind that some of the research on bilingualism has shown that like, this is a strength in a lot of areas that autistic yes. individuals are weak in. For example, bilingual autistic individuals tend to have better executive functioning skills, mm -hmm. so they're better at switching task is at think going along multiple trains and that sort of thing and then a monolingual autistic children they have better theory of mind skills so they're better at reasoning what other people think because they're used to switching languages with different people and then their monolingual autistic peers so 
it, 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 like if your child's struggling a lot with learning even one language, I can definitely get that this is a definite tension and it's also going to be something that comes up in conflict with your care team at times. Mm -hmm. But it is worth keeping in mind that bilingualism a lot of times can be a strength in the areas that are seen as weakest in autistic individuals yeah. and can in fact support them in a way that a lot of other things can. Yeah. yeah but three-year-old uh, is a difficult stage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, you want to do any of the other written ones? Well, Megan, uh, should we address other questions? Let's, Let's see. I have the list up. So... Trying to think. I feel like we covered most of the ones that are regarding kind of your research. Some of these are more clinical specific. Yeah. If, if you see any that you would like to address or if anyone wants to pop anything into the chat, we can be here for the next few minutes. There was one about AAC uh, and uh, I uh, actually, it's not my specialty, but I did ask uh, my colleague and uh, uh, they have shared some resources uh, and I have included them in the resource page, um, the document that we are sharing. So uh, yeah, definitely check that out if you're interested in AAC uh, treatments uh, in autism. Um, there are two links over there. Um, and I can speak to that briefly too. Um... Augmentative and alternative communication, first and foremost, is a supportive tool. So if you find that it's not working, maybe maybe a, a different tool than the specific system that you're using could be more beneficial. And so every system has a different vocabulary layout, different images, um, different programming. Um, and so I think not knowing the specific context of um, your AAC user, I'm not sure whether it might be better to kind of continue to support use of the current system or explore others. Um, but that's something that definitely, if you have more specific questions or you just wanna brainstorm, feel free to email me um, and we can get a little bit more information about what the history of therapy has looked like and, and things you've already explored. And uh, there was one of the questions on the list that I specifically wanted to address, not just like in relation to our talk, but that I feel is a helpful viewpoint to have with your children when discussing things with your autistic children. Uh, this was a question on um, that navigating social communication, especially understanding the child understanding um, when he's providing correction and guidance to peers can perceive his bossiness and how do you work and empower him in these moments. Uh, so. One of the growing things from like the autistic side of research in the field of autism is this theory that is referred to as the double empathy theory. Mm -hmm. It's the idea at, that it's not that the, the autistic child necessarily has these deficits, these difficulties, these problems, all the problems are in yes. the corner with them. Yeah. It's that the way the autistic child, the autistic teen, the autistic adult, all the autistic people in general view